Hey, History 7. Um, I hope that you are having a good day. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over like the couple pages that you guys have taken notes on. Um, remember to be watching the whole video for your code word, which I'm going to throw in. I'm making up your code word right now. I'm going to throw in at some point during this video. So make sure you're paying attention for that. I'll say it a couple times. Um, <clears throat> and don't forget to email me your code word. Um, remember, you need to watch any videos that I included. Um, these are videos that we would normally watch in class. I'm going to talk um, fairly quickly. I don't want to get like too into things because I don't want you guys to have to spend 45 minutes sitting here listening and watching me because that's weird. I did print off some pictures that you can see. As I'm going, I'll kind of hold them up. I was hoping I could switch and show you on my computer, but that didn't work. So um, that's kind of just the plan, and I'll do the same thing on Friday. Um, the big thing is that you guys have to be reading and taking notes and read the whole thing. Don't just like read and like, oh, I got my 15 facts, I'm done. You gotta read the whole thing, okay? Because I am not gonna go over everything, um, and there will be some kind of a test when we're done. So um, it'll be a little different, but it will be a test. So. Uh, this chapter is all about the Industrial Revolution. Hopefully you guys, by the way, watched that history or his story about the revolution that was, Industrial Revolution, that was pretty cool um, for him to do that for us. So anyway, so this is the big thing about the Industrial Revolution, is it's just this huge time of change. Um, just everything changes, things change quickly, um, life changes for everybody, it's just kind of a great time of adjustment and change as we go. Um, and it just kind of, there was this shift from everyone farming, everyone making their own stuff to now you could go and buy your things at the store. Not everybody had to farm because they have all these ne new technologies. Um, and then they have machines that start uh, manufacturing and then you have factories. And um, so it's just kind of a neat um, time to be alive, I'm sure, for the people just because things change. Um, now, first of all, um, we have an agricultural revolution, meaning things changed for farmers. Um, and it also helped bring up the food supply, which changes everything, because if you have more control over the food supply, that means you also, just society is better, you don't have as much starvation, that kind of thing. One of the big things um, was crop rotation, where they started um, rotating um, how they uh, so the big thing is like corn is an example. It takes um, nutrients out of the soil and so you need to, and if you don't um, rotate crops, your soil ends up becoming so depleted that corn won't grow anymore. And so um, what they did is they learned, um, and this is why you see farms around here do it, is soybeans actually put those nutrients back in the soil. So farmers will either plant corn for a couple years and then switch or they'll do like one year soybean, one year corn um, to put those nutrients back in. And so that's something they discovered. They also discovered fertilization, um, just like the importance of fertilizing crops and how much it helps. And then just also some different machines. Um, they also had a better understanding of animal breeding um, and just how that works and just how to take care of their animals better. And so that just kind of helped bring about modern farming. Now, um, because of the food supply going up, families could now have more children um, and they were needed to work on the farm. So it kind of is this rotating thing. These changes contributed to a very large British population. Um, it went from six and a half million to nine million between 1750 and 1800. So it grows very rapidly. Um, this also caused, so a lot of times back then, and that even this even happened in the United States, is just like land was open. Um, you could just kind of drift around, animals drifted around. Um, and when this, um, a greater demand for food happens, farmers start enclosing their land, um, and, um, but this is what happens though, a lot of poor farmers could not support their families on these small plots of land that were left to them, and so they had to move and work in cities, and so that brings about a lot of change. Um, <clears throat> landowners also started to raise more sheep, um, and their wool obviously was a big cash crop, meaning they made a lot of money on that. They obviously couldn't use all of that, but they could send that out. Now, sheep farmers, though, don't need as many workers. Um, and so because of that, that also caused um, people to move to the cities. Um, and it also helped develop cottage industries. And what a cottage industry, it was where um, wool was spun and merged to make cloth, early spinning wheels, kind of like if you've seen the movie I get to tie in my Disney movie still. Um, if you've watched uh, Sleeping Beauty, um, the spinning wheel that's in there is what they use for wool. Obviously, that one's for a curse, but 
Um, and then early spinning wheels and looms could fit in a home or a shop. But then later, these machines get bigger and they can put multiple of them going and produce a lot of wool. Um, most inventors improved. Um, so a lot of inventions that were coming out improved the planting of crops, cultivating and harvesting, and it just kind of made life better. So one of them, one of these inventors was Jethro Tull. He developed a seed drill, and this, let's see if you guys can see it, is what it, this is terrible. This is what a seed drill looks like, okay? Um, and a seed drill is obviously for um, putting seeds in the ground. It actually helped them put them in rows across a plot of land. Um, they were pretty slow to start using this tool. Um, they used to scatter their seed by hand, um, but this actually allowed them to grow more crops with using less seed because it was just more efficient. Um, it also paved the way for use of other farming inventions um, because it put in these evenly spaced rows. If you're just kind of tossing the seeds out, um, you're just it's not going to be very even, um, and so it just makes it kind of harder and, you know, so then there is the iron plow, which you guys probably know some about because you guys go to school in Grandy Tour, which is where John Deere is from. Um, and there was a plow starting in 1730, 30, and then there was an improved um, cast iron one in 1763. Um, and so this, they just kind of continued to improve. John Deere is obviously the one who is most famous, I think, for improving it. Um, and it made it possible that farmers could farm land that before they couldn't so like the steel plow when John Deere improve um, makes that one it makes it like our soil is kind of rocky and it would sometimes either break the um, break the plow or it would get stuck and so the steel plow is just a lot smoother and just makes it easier um, for them to do um, and then for centuries wheat and other grains have been harvested and separated from the husk by hand and they had that little like tool it's hard to kind of explain it's like this curved almost like a knife kind of thing and they used to have to do that by hand um, and if you can imagine that takes forever and so they started finding new ways to do that um, an, a guy named Andrew Michael developed a threshing machine in 1786 and it enabled a few men to separate the wheat from the husks and stalks quickly so you no longer have one guy out there and here's the threshing machine you no longer have one guy out there doing it all by hand you can have just a couple guys doing a whole bunch so um, that made a huge difference as well. I hope this is all making sense to you. Now, um, in the United States, um, our biggest crop, um, and it was actually called King Cotton for a long time because our number one crop was cotton. The only thing about cotton, um, and I don't know if you've ever gotten to see it like growing or anything like that, it's mainly in the South, is that it is a lot of work. Um, there are little seeds in there. Um, first of all, you have to pick it. Then you have all these seeds in there. And the seeds take forever. Um, and I mean forever. Forever, forever to get the seeds out of there. It actually says one worker could process one pound of cotton per day by hand. So if you can imagine, it just takes forever and you have to have a lot of workers, a lot of slaves. Unfortunately, this is the time period of slaves. Um, and so in 1793, a guy named Eli Whitney is his name. He comes up with this little machine called the cotton gin. Let's see if you guys can see that. Hopefully you can. Okay, it's just like a hand crank. Um, and what it does is it separates the cotton from the um, seeds. So it just kind of removes the seeds. And this actually allowed them to process it so much faster. One worker could process 50 pounds of cotton a day. So it goes from one pound to 50 pounds. Um, so it's amazing. Um, and you would think, oh, they don't need as many slaves. They can reduce the number. Actually, what happened, unfortunately, is that um, they started just wanting to grow more cotton um, because they can process it faster. And so it kind of, it didn't get rid of slavery at all. Um, they needed them for the planting and the harvesting and all that kind of stuff, unfortunately. There was another American, um, his name is Cyrus McCormick. He invented a horse-drawn reaping machine. I do not have a picture of that for some reason. Um, in 1831, it enabled farmers to cut wheat a lot quicker. Um, prior to this invention, a lot of laborers were needed to cut it, um, and the process was just super slow. Um, with his reaping machine, more acres could be harvested in less time, which you're going to see, like, the repeated thing is just less time, um, less workers. Um... And so this device, along with the threshing machine, which we talked about and I showed you a picture of, led to the increased wheat production, and it reduced the number of farm laborers needed. So then those farm laborers need a job. Um, and so that's kind of 
uh, where cities and factories and stuff came in. Now a huge thing that comes out too during this time is steam power. Um, and I have a video that you're going to be sent um, the link to, so make sure you watch that video on the steam engine. It's um, If you look on the picture on 225, if you have your book open, you probably should have your book open, by the way, when we're doing these, because um, you can kind of follow along like we do in class. Um, there's that steam engine there. I have a video of something similar, and it just kind of shows you how it works. It's not the most exciting video, but you can at least kind of see how it works, so make sure you watch that. It's only a minute. Um, and just kind of shows you. So steam power also assisted the agricultural invention or revolution. During the 1850s and 60s, there was an engineer, his name is John Fowler, and he developed one of the first known self-propelled steam engines. Um, and so he had the steam tractor, it would plow fil fields, dig um, drainage uh, channels, and if you can imagine, um, it made a huge difference for farmers eventually when they're able to start using it. It also lowered the cost of plowing fields. It reduced the number of laborers. Again, reduced the number of laborers and the amount of time. And so you also didn't need um, teams of horses and oxen. Um, it just made things so much simpler. And it also drained, um, they could dig these channels and it would drain water from previously unusable land. So maybe there was, you know how like you're driving through fields and you see fields that are just flooded when it rains a lot, especially lately, um, they could actually go in and use this to kind of drain out that land and it made more land available for planting, which is a huge difference. And there is a little box here that says that um, his engines were far too heavy to pull a plow across fields. Um, instead, he would place one engine at the edge of the field and then place a second engine on the opposite edge. Um, and then they had cables and it would pull the plow in one direction um, and the other would pull it back. So obviously it's not the most efficient um, at this point in time that it was just too big. And so he had these two engines um, on each end and there was like a cable and you would pull to one end and then pull back the other way. So it's not the most efficient way to do it. Um, that comes much later. Um, well, not that much later, but, um, so yeah, just kind of really cool, um, technology that was coming out. Obviously today we're like, what? That sounds awful, but that's just kind of how it works. Now, the big question is why Great Britain, like why is Great Britain where things started? And in 1815, Britain was just the most thriving nation in Europe. They had cottage industries that made many goods which I talked about cottage industries before, um, their large merchant fleet then would transport these goods abroad. Because remember, England is an island and they have tons of ships and they're used to traveling by ship. And so they're able to get all of this stuff out quickly um, and efficiently to other countries. Um, they also had this great banking system and government. Um, they had a growing population. Um, they had great natural resources, especially iron ore and coal, and it just seemed to be like the perfect location for the advance of industry. Some can conclude that this combination of factors was just an accident of history. However, we know as Christians uh, that these uh, that this is just the hand of God in arranging all of these details and making possible the Industrial Revolution in Britain. It's called divine providence that God um, kind of makes everything work together for his good. Um, and kind of sets things up um, to work the way he wants them to. Um, so then we have um, the Industrial Revolution. There's also a video that is being t sent to you about the Industrial Revolution. I think it's like six minutes. Um, it's kind of interesting. It kind of shows you like change and just a lot of the good stuff that's happening. Um, and so this is just during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and again, it started in Great Britain. Um, and the first thing was like the big, large weaving machines. Um, and it led industry to migrate from these little cottages and shops, you know, like cobblers made shoes. Um, and you'd go to cobbler and be like, hey, I need a pair of shoes. And he would make you a pair of shoes. Now you can just go to a store and buy a pair of shoes that were made in a factory. Um, you know, kind of like today you go to a store and they have like size six through 12 of, you know, a certain shoe. Um, and then back then you used to go and say like, I need a seven. They would measure you perfectly. Um, and make your shoe. Now it's just streamlined. Everything's kind of done the same way clothes do. Um, you no longer have to make your clothes. You can go, just go to a store um, and buy them. Um, and these shops were centrally, lo centrally located. They were generally by water because um, they would start using water power. Um, animals actually initially provided power for some of the larger machines and then they would use running water where um, that was available because um, they would have these big wooden wheels that the water would turn and it would power um, 
various machines. Animals, though, could not always produce enough power, and water isn't always a constant. You know, sometimes there might be a drought year, and then your power isn't as good, and just different during different seasons. Um, like during the winter, if the water freezes, you can't go anywhere. Um, so, and it, think about like if it floods too, that could definitely shut down a mill and make a huge mess. Um, and so factories just needed a reliable source and that's where like the big steam engines come into play. James Watt um, did not invent this device. He, can't turn the page, uh, made improvements. Um, and that's a big thing too, is that sometimes you'll see, well, this guy's credited, but he didn't actually invent it. Um, no, but he might have made the one that was good enough that everybody could use. So, um, you know, like, uh, making like the first one is super important, but also kind of like, um, Thomas Edison is always the one who's credited for the light bulb. He didn't invent the light bulb, but, um, he was the one who brought it to where, like the early inventions, you could turn on the light and then it would blow and that was it. Um, and so he made it so that way you could actually leave the light on um, and it wouldn't blow out. So um, that's why it's so important and that's why he's credited. So I just want you to understand that, that these guys sometimes just improved upon things. Um, and he made them that it made it more efficient. Steam engines um, powered machines that had been driven by water or animals, so it was just more reliable. They could also pull heavier loads, um, like tractors and locomotives, so trains start coming up through this time period as well. In addition, steam was used to power ships and even some very early automobiles. Um, steam engines provided consistent and reliable power. Um, that's the big thing, is just consistent and reliable. Um, then there were some other very important inventors. John Kay um, is famous for the flying shuttle. Um, here's a picture of the flying shuttle. This little, oh my gosh, this little thing right here is the flying shuttle. Okay, and you can kind of see the big um, thing here, uh, which is a loom. This is a loom, and it has like a flying shuttle in it, okay? Um, and so it's just this little device and it, he added it to a weaving machine and it could enable workers to weave the strands of cotton into cloth so much faster. Um, and it created a growing demand for spools of thread to supply to the weavers. And so then you have, um, another need, um, that they had to have thread quickly. And so James Hargreaves invented the spinning Jenny, which was in 1764. Um, and this is a spinning Jenny right here. Okay, I hope you guys can see this okay. I think you can. Um, <clears throat> and so this spinning jenny could quickly spin many strands of cotton into thread. So it was just so much faster than what they had before. Um, as demand increased, then they started making even more machines to make cloth even quicker. Um, and so it was just kind of see a need, you fill the need with a new invention. Um, and so in addition, production of iron and steel also allowed them to make... Um, the metal needed for a lot of inventions as well. And so it just kind of builds off each other and grows and just builds more job opportunities and that kind of thing. Um, men who developed businesses, this is a vocab word in your book, um, are called entrepreneurs. Um, it's actually a French word meaning one who undertakes between two uh, different parties. Um, they undertook to connect industry to the market. Um, so businesses to um, people who could buy their stuff. Um, Let's see, Richard Arkwright became one of the most famous entrepreneurs. Um, he is credited with inventing many machines. He also got the government, and this is the big deal, to um, pass what is called a patent. Now, what a patent is, is it's something super important to make sure it protects the inventor. Um, because someone could, like, I could invent something and, like, go to sell it online, and then somebody sees it and is like, oh, I'm going to make the same invention. Um, and then I lose out because maybe they, you know, just put a different sticker and people see that one instead. Um, so if I apply for a, pa a patent on my invention, that person cannot make the same invention for so many years. And then after that, they actually have to pay me for my invention ideas. Um, and so he just kind of um, protected what he is making. Um which is really, really cool. Um, it is one way to protect our inventors. It's a way to also encourage people to invent things. Um, men like Arkwright developed contracts with banks and wealthy people, and they provided the needed money, or what's called capital, to make their inventions, um, which is just really cool. So, um, 
And it just kind of like is this circle. You make an invention, you sell things, you need another invention, somebody else makes an invention, it provides jobs, um, that kind of thing. Now, um, what are the big factors that encourage the rise of industry? Well, one is just um, the growing population. You need more people to be able to work because you have more people. Um, another thing is just the raw materials. They had so many raw materials, including wool, iron ore, and coal. And so that encourages the growth of industry. Another thing was this, just the government in England during this time is very stable. Um, they have the same ruler for quite a long time. Um, Queen Victoria is a big part of this. Her husband, Albert, was very much into new inventions and kind of changing things for the better. Um, Victoria wasn't always into that, but her husband really pushed um, for it. Um, and just England is very stable during this time. Um, and this is another thing that he talked about actually in the video, um, that I sent out last week, the guy from history or history is that Britain was very much into protecting their inventions and making sure they stayed in Britain. Um, and so they tried very hard to block, um, their inventions being taken to other countries and their ideas. Obviously they couldn't prevent it. Um, but what they decided to do is make money by exporting their stuff. Um, and soon the British exported their inventions to other European countries and North America. Um, British laborers would travel and kind of help them set them up. Um, and so it helped to really finance. Um, and they had like investors from Britain that would actually finance these factories in other countries. And it really helped the spread of industry. And Britain was the one who played the big role. So the four things um, that encouraged the rise of industry is the population. Number two, just the raw materials that they had. Number three is the stable governments. And just number four is like their patents and just making sure to protect their items and that kind of thing. Because then people are making money off their inventions and they want to keep inventing because they're making money. So um, anyway, I don't think I said your code word. You actually had one at the end today. Sometimes I put them in the middle. Um, your code word for today is industrial, um, like the industrial revolution. So you need to send me in an email the word industrial. Um, and yeah, so that's your code word. Send it to me and I'll give you points for watching the video. Um, don't forget there are two other videos you need to watch. And I believe you do have homework today. Your homework is to read... Make sure you read all the pages, 228 to 232. The video for Friday should not be as long, by the way, because it's shorter. Um, and uh, take 15 notes. So read 228 to 232, which you should have in your paper anyway, and take 15 notes. I, have you, I hope you have a great day. I will see you on Friday with a video and, well, a video like to say hi and a video for history. So have a great day. <laughs> Can't talk. And I will see you on Friday.